Okay, so, uh, so our event today is, um, is an online book launch for um, Steve Ash's fascinating book, Explaining Morality. Um, you'll see um, first of Steve's slides on the screen already, which gives you the, the further detail. Um, the format that we're going to have today is we're going to start with um, Steve giving us uh, a, a talk about his book for about half an hour. Um, and then we're going to have comments from myself um, and then comments from Lee Price, who's with us. Um, then Steve will have a chance to respond to that and then we'll throw the, the conversation open to the floor. Um, and we should have a half an hour or so for question and answer, and, and we're aiming to finish at 2.30 um, UK time, so that's in an hour and a half from now. Um, so we're going to start then with uh, Steve telling us uh, something about his book. Um, Steve, I, I wasn't expecting to have to introduce Steve, so um, I'm going to just say something very brief. Steve seems to have been around critical reason for quite a long time. I, this is, this is slightly speculative, but I think I may have met Steve at my own very first Critical Realist conference in 2004. Um, so, and, and, and he was a long-term PhD student of Andrew Collier, who's a, a, a prominent and influential early Critical Realist who sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, and this book that we're talking about today is based on that PhD. Um, Steve has been uh, developing that argument alongside a full-time career in the fire service. So he's, he's not the, the classic academic, um, but, but nevertheless, he certainly works to a high academic standard. Um, and Steve has recently also become treasurer of the Center for Critical Realism. Um, so it's with great pleasure that we welcome Steve today to um, talk to us about, about his book, Explaining Morality. Steve, over to you. Thanks very much, Dave. And so I'm going to stand up. I'll just have to adjust my camera a second because I, I really don't like sitting down and trying to talk. It never really works for me that very well. Um, so, yes, thanks, Dave. And uh, I'm here to talk about the book that came out in the end of last month, Explaining Morality, which is the application of critical reason to moral questions. And it's available from the Routledge website. And according to about Routledge, if it's not available from the website for some reason or other, if you wish to get it or purchase it for your uh, academic library, then it's available from obviously the Woodbrook Sellers. And so it's within their Critical Realism uh, Studies series in Routledge. And obviously, thanks to the Critical Realism Network for hosting this online book, award, uh, book launch. So, starting off really, This book's obviously about morality, and morality is an aspect of our work life and reflections. And I think all of us, probably over the weekend, like any other weekend, and over the mornings where we've been, you know, looking at the news or things, have had reflections about certain issues where moral subjects come up. You know, honesty in, in democracy, the relationship between the two, justice and just war. Um, you know, the rights and wrongs of various things, and we use that language of right, wrong, good, and evil. Uh, all the time, but as an aspect of social reality, not only is it problematic to inquire into as a, as a subject, because it's an aspect of social reality, it's problematic to explore into because you've got a variety of different um, views on those, those concerns, those, those words, that language, <clears throat> and a variety of different approaches to actually trying to understand that. And because of that, the, over the history of moral philosophy, it's moved towards a position of looking at the wider questions of morality. And what I do in this book is I look at how critical realism has approached the wider questions in morality, not specific examples of moral questions. However, before I come on to those wider questions of morality, what I do do is I try to uh, ground those uh, discussions all the way through the book by using one specific example. And I use the example of slavery. And I use the example of slavery for three reasons. And the first is because it's a current issue of moral concern. At the moment, unbelievably to myself, many other people, I'm sure most people in this call will share that view, if not all of us. How can in this 
day and age, somebody feel that it's appropriate to own another human being and treat them as your property with the power of life or death over them. It's absolutely appalling that that occurs. So morality and its application to slavery in its modern format is obviously an issue of current moral concern. The second thing, the one where I find slavery particularly interesting, is it indicates how moral positions change over time. Because whilst morality is currently illegal, sorry, slavery is currently illegal, up to 150 years ago, there was a legal framework in many countries that allowed slavery to continue and progress, and slave owners had rights over their home beauty other human beings because of that framework. So that for me is a really interesting point from a view of exploring morality and that how is it that moral positions change over time? And the third reason why I use slavery is because critical realism classes itself as an emancipatory project. And if it can't say something useful or informative about a subject such as slavery, you've got to question its own self-definition as being an emancipatory in its approach to trying to understand the world. So the structure of the book is I look at some of those wider questions of morality and the book follows really those questions with the first five chapters looking at those first five questions and the sixth and seventh chapter look at the final question with whether or not the critical realist moral theories can provide an explanation of morality as an aspect of reality. The first question about the legitimacy of moral arguments comes from that human distinction between facts and values, which has been really prevalent within moral philosophy for the last 400 years and has a massive influence on, on the way that science approaches questions of morality. So social science, and Andrew Sayer argues it really well in his book about why values matter to people, the idea that social science should be value free, that facts and values can never cross into each other and you can never use your rationality to inquire into um, morality. The second question is whether or not those moral positions, if we're going to identify them, can be understood to apply universally. Uh, the third one is about actually morality, actually how it informs us moral psychology, how we use morality in our everyday life. And the fourth is about that morality as an aspect of society. And those questions two to four, I really, I think, are ontological questions are about the nature of morality. The fifth question is actually about how we discover more about morality. And I've highlighted that blue there, because whilst in the book, I cover that in that order. In this presentation, I'm going to pick up that at the end of the presentation. And then finally, like I say, I explore where, how those critical risk moral theories provide an explanation of morality. So if I start from the first one, which is that question of facts and values, what I do in chapter one is I very much explore basic critical realism because the argument that critical realism can uses against the fact value distinction is uh, the position of explanatory critique, which is in Basco's basic critical realism, which says that you can, in circumstances, produce using social science, an ex explanation of an aspect of society that is also criticism, using no other aspect than the valuing of truth, which is fundamental to all um, logical arguments. That breaks down that unbridgeable divide. But I explore it by using the ontology for two reasons. And the first is because I need to position that argument. But secondly, I need to make sure that when I'm then looking at other uh, people who've used critical realism around morality, I'm using it in a way that I'm, my reference point is actually that overall ontology. So the first chapter really covers that a lot of detail. It covers transcendental realism, critical naturalism, and explanatory critique. And really what I try to pull out of that is this key thing, which I love this, this pitch, the logic of science discovery, which is what Basker says about that depth realism and how science finds out things about the world, that actually when you see a result of regularity and event that we are seeing and what you're identifying, is underlying gendered mechanisms in reality that you cannot observe, but you can observe their effects and you can assume they exist by the, those effects. And what natural science can do is through the process of experiment can identify, can take those potential mechanisms that we've modeled and can make uh, and can draw a conclusion on their reality or not by being able to isolate in that scientific experiment and applying it to the real world where those mechanisms work in conjunction with other mechanisms as causal configurations to generate the events that we see. And I think that's a really rich approach and understanding of causality. And so when you look at an aspect of social science, for example, uh, whether or not the, what the social determinants of a slavery community would be, then as Basker rightly under, um, points out, science does explanations, it doesn't do predictions in the social science, it's the massive 
uh, uh, amount of mechanisms in play that lead to a specific event, which means you can never do an, ex um, an experiment that would allow you to uh, isolate one of those mechanisms. But what's also interesting is when you look at all those different mechanisms in play for a slave-free community, is one of them will be this, those human rights value for all. So values are an aspect of society that we can study and explore using critical naturalism. Um, when you look at that human rights value for all, it's a, it's a legitimate area of study. When we talk about that, there's two different ways where you can understand that, that aspect to be. And that leads on to the second chapter about can moral positions be understood to apply universally. But you can understand that human rights value for all in two different ways. One is that morality exists because of a universal aspect of reality. So our value that we have is due to value being separate to our recognition of it. It exists whether or not we know it occurs. So in that respect, we say that human rights are valued by all because there is something fundamental about being a human being that is valuable and therefore we have rights that arise from that humanity. The second position is that universality may be something we can aspire to in the future, that we could all agree on a set of um, moral standards that we, we would then enforce in society. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is something that is a desirable um, aspect because we would all agree that we would like to be treated as if we've got rights and not due to something fundamental about being human. Now, when I explore these, and I explore these two books, uh, these two different positions by using Basker's critical realism, uh, sorry, Basker's dialectical critical realism and dialectical critical realist ethics, and Day's position on, uh, which is an opposition, opposition to that. And I explore that by using that and trying to tie that in through that ontology of critical realism. And so what I, what I suggest, and this is, I've spelt that wrongly, I do apologise, that's terrible, isn't it? Um, <laughs> What I suggest is that inquiries into moralities are inquiries that are seeking to identify the relevant mechanisms of the structure they emerge from. And this comes very much from that trans, transitive and transitive di, uh, dimension of science. That actually, rival, moral, rival theories are about something in the world that exists separate to those theories. And there's no difference with that than morality. And when we're identifying and uh, trying to explore into morality, what we're trying to inquire into is what are those mechanisms and what are the structures they emerge from? And I always use this picture when I talk about emergence because I think that's such, again, a really powerful thing of critical realism is that you look at those, those birds in flight, they form a particular structure. Once they form that structure, then what emerges from that structure is the reduction of the effort on every single bird in that flight. It's an emergent property that doesn't, it doesn't exist in any of the individual birds. It only exists when that structure is formed. And when that structure is dissolved, that causal power no longer exists. And I think that's the really interesting thing about critical realism, how it explores mechanisms and its understanding of the world, that non-reductive understanding of um, causation. So like I say, I use that in the transitive and transit dimension to draw a conclusion that I would favor Bascar's approach, which is the moral realist approach over, over, over David Aldabasis. So when we ask where does morality emerge from, well, if we're talking about mechanisms emerging from relative enduring contingent structures, then what Basker argues, and this is his model of the social cube in the natural setting, is that there is something about humans in society, in nature, that leads to an intransitive object of morality. And it's that intransitive object of morality that then our transitive moralities are about. They're theories about that intransitive object of morality. And actually, it's within that relationship of humans in society and nature that leads to the emergence of morality. So while morality may emerge in different formats, in different historical circum, uh, social historical circumstances, it will always emerge because of something that is fundamental to that relationship. And that's a really useful, I think, perspective on moral realism. However, what it doesn't help too much is, is moving forward that inquiry. Because what Basker said is that within reality, somewhere, or all of reality, emerges something that leads to morality. And you need to drill that down in a little bit more detail. So when we're looking at the two aspects of morality informing our choices of actions, morality is an aspect of society, it's really useful that transformational model of social activity, which obviously has those two things on there. And again, with Archer's work, which differentiates in the society um, strata between culture, culture and structure, what you can say is that actually morality exists as an aspect of culture in those cultural values, Morality exists within human beings as a personal values that we all hold. 
And so those are the two areas you can tease into and explore in a little bit more detail. And historically, the, um, the, the work that's been done on morality through by critical realists follows the path of the next person who really looked at it in great detail was Andrew Collier, who looked at the personal values in being and worth. And that's the subject of the third chapter. And so when Collier looks at morality and boys and form our choices of actions, they look at a, a, what would be a typical moral problem. And this is one that's very much used as a thought experiment, the trolley, the trolley problem, if everyone's aware of it, of you've got two choices there, which, which way to um, click the lever, either one has an unacceptable outcome. How do you deal with that situation? What Collier argues is for a cognitive paradigm of morality. And so he talks about rationally directed emotions where there's no difference between the way we do moral reasoning and any other reasoning. We are actually looking at a situation we're making judgments using our rationality. And that's rational directed emotions. And those emotions are either rational or irrational. Now, what that requires is, is that value has to be separate to our, to our recognition of it. We have, must have a reference point of value in the world. And what Collier uses really um, usefully is that distinction he starts to call intrinsic value worth. And that's really useful because values, valuing, cultural values, personal values, it can all get a bit confusing. The, the reference to something that is intrinsic to an aspect of reality, that intrinsic value, calling it worth, I think helps with the conversation in itself. And then of course, what he's got to do is he says, um, what he doesn't do, sorry, is he doesn't align how that understanding with, aligns with existing values. So in all of Collier's examples, somebody is using their rationality to make a decision based on a reference only to intrinsic value. They never refer to the values that are held within society. And that I think comes from Collier's background within um, moral philosophy, where all moral reasoning is seen as a cognitive process. So the, the decisions I would make about vegetarianism, the way you're weighing any options and deciding what is right and what is wrong, is how moral philosophy feels that all reasoning processes take place. But of course, in reality, the trolley problem is not like that. It's much more complex like that. The moral situations we face on everyday circumstances are incredibly complex. And what I draw on here is some of the other research I'm aware of, which is around how people make decisions in emergency situations. So nurses in emergency rooms, um, people who are managing emergency situations where there's a life and death decision to make, how do they make those decisions? And very much what that research indicates is they don't use an analytical process of deductive reasoning. They'll either use a conditioned response or they will use recognition prime decision making. And so in that respect, what you can understand values to be is almost morphogenically generated connect, um, cognitive shortcuts that allows you to make decisions really, really quickly by reference to the values that you hold. And so that means you need to explore as part of moral psychology, you need to explore the values that are held in the society and how they exist. That moves me on chapter four into discussing um, Sayer's work, which is on oh, his work on lay morality, why values matter to people, and his work on biological normativity. And what Sayer argues is that morality is concerned with human flourishing. And I've got a question mark about that because I'll come back to that later on. But what he does say is that we're motivated to promote the flourishing of others because our relationship with the world is one of care. And he does a lot of work um, in his book, Explore, and his, and his articles exploring neuroscience and how you can understand values as summative, uh, summative markers. And I might have had that phrase slightly wrong. But then he talks about how actually values have effect in society. And what he says is that those cultural values, those existing moral rules and uh, norms have the effect of the approval and disapproval of others. And that's how they have causal power. Now, when you talk about that and the human flourishing side of things, what I think potentially Sayer has done here is he's, he's tried to abstract out a definition of morality, which doesn't actually cover all aspects of morality, because we will use morality around environmental ethics, animal rights, and those areas aren't covered by human flourishing. Now, I'll hold that thought there and then come into really a little bit more about how we can actually understand the moral realist position in relation to how we make that reason process. So, Steve, Steve, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just one of, one of the audience has asked if you could maybe just slow down a touch. Yeah, sorry. Just, just having trouble just keeping up with your I do apologize, I will, I will slow down a little bit. Um, so, you look at this slide here, what you can see is basically it's the, um, it's based on the transformational model of social activity. 
But what I've tried to put in there is the aspects of reality with intrinsic value. So if I talk this through as, a, as, a, as an example, in the 19th century, people realized that clean drinking water had intrinsic value for human flourishing. Um, and they made that value statement on the basis of observations, um, death rates around certain pumps in London, um, cholera rates around the country. And they realized that actually you need clean drinking water had intrinsic value for human beings. Now, once you've made that value statement on the basis of an observation of intrinsic value, that lead, then led to people making changes to the world on the basis of that value. So we saw sewage systems, sewage treatment works, we saw massive changes to the world around us because clean drinking water was valued. And I would suggest that, out, that emerging out of that relationship of individual value and agents interacting with reality on the basis of their understanding of intrinsic value, that leads to the emergence of cultural values. So that while, while as originally going back 150 years, you had to put forward a scientific argument for why you needed a sewage treatment system. If someone tried to drink out the toilet in your house or tried to empty a chemical toilet in the reservoir, it just wouldn't be what we do around here. It's a cultural value. We don't have to reference the underlying observation of intrinsic value. It's just a cultural value that we make sure that water is kept clear. And I think you can talk around most values in some way or another of trying to tease down if you've got a cultural value, what's its history of emergence? What is the original value statement which refers into the aspect of reality and intrinsic value? Because over here, people are just using cultural values interacting with the world but we need to trace back a little bit further and trying to understand where that is. So I've put this screen onto this other slide here, which again at the top is the transformational model of social activity with that line coming from emergence. And you can see there's a dotted line there and above the line is the non-moral realist positions. And the moral realist positions would say there's something below the line, that those values are emerging from some sort of relationship as Basker describes it, humans in society and nature. And that means there must be some sort of value independent of its recognition in nature, social reality and humanity. Now, what I've tried to do with this now, and I think this is what hopefully is my contribution to the discussion and debate within this book and what, what I'd, I'd like to advance further and what, what I'm exploring, is if you're talking about value being independent of its recognition, if you're talking about worth, then somehow it must have causal power, which means you must be able to understand it theoretically of having emerged from relatively enduring structures. So if you try to understand what has value independent of its recognition, you should be able to do a causal and a structural analysis that explains to you actually what is this value independent of its recognition. So just to summarize really where I am with the book, what you can see here is these are the authors I've discussed in relation to specific terms in relation to that overall um, approach of using critical reason for morality. And what I then discuss is this area here, which I think is the area that isn't, which actually, how do we understand worth as an emergent property? So the moral risk positions, just to summarize, you've got Sayer who talks about real suffering and flourishing and having a biological basis. You've got Collier's position that all being is being as worth as a rock or a person or a football team. And Basker with his position of meta-reality, which again, I explore in chapter six, which sees Really, there's some sort of ground state where we're all connected, which means that all reality has value because we're all part of the same reality. And I've really over-summarised Basker there to a certain extent. And please forgive me any of those who are really into reality because I'm just trying to cover this in, in some detail, but not too much detail. And then, of course, you've got the non-moral realist positions, which is, which is Dave Aldovasis, which doesn't accept the concept of the moral realism position. What I think is worth noting is they're all secular moralities. Um, People, most people are aware that the spiritual term from Bhaskar and Collier's work on Christianity, actually when they're laying out a moral position, you don't need any supreme being or any um, religious concept to be able to support their morality that they're putting forward. What I think is the weakness of them is they're all too abstract. They don't allow us to work from the concrete to understand actually what they mean by these positions. And so, if I'm talking about moral theories being models that are justified by their explanatory power, then within the social world, what you're looking at is trying to move from events to ex explain mechanisms. And if you, if you can do that abstraction then and move from explaining mechanisms by event by structures, you're working purely abstract reasoning. Why I suggest that Sayer, 
Baskar and Collier all do is they're putting forward an abstract understanding. So all the positions they put forward are very abstract, but actually you need to be able to tie it down to the concrete, particularly if you want to use a moral position, because it has to be applied to the concrete. So what I try to do is then try to explore that concrete to understand how you can then make a position um, on what actually is the emergence of worth. So what I try to do is understand worth as on a generative notion of causality. And there's a question I use there, which really comes from that understanding of reality that's within critical realism, because as we've said, mechanisms emerge from relative enduring contingent structures. But that raises a question. Why is a structure relative enduring? What is it that makes it continue to endure? So if I look at that simple example there on the left of the lever, um, which we can see that the component parts of the pivot and the, the rod, the power, causal power of mechanical advantage doesn't exist in either of those parts, but it only exists when you put, bring them together in a certain formulation, when you've got that correct relationship. But if that guy who's using that lever goes off to have a cup of tea with a, and has a chat with his friend, that lever is still going to be in position. What is it that makes it relatively enduring? In that circumstance, you could say that actually the mechanism of friction has causal power to ensure that lever is relatively enduring. When you look at the eye, which is another really simple structure, it's not shown on there, but part and parcel of the eye, which has the mechanism of sight, is the blink mechanism. And that blink mechanism allows the eye to keep clean and keep moist and allows the, work to, the, the eye to continue to flourish. So it's not a part of the eye, but you can understand the blink mechanism as something that has causal power within that structure, makes it relatively enduring. Why would you just that all structures have mechanisms that have effect at a structural level to promote their continuation or flourishing? And actually within those structures, those specific mechanisms can understand, um, be understood to have intrinsic value or worth. To just summarize that, and I will slow down significantly on this point because this is really the main point I'm trying to make, get across. All relative enduring structures have mechanisms which work as tendencies as part of a causal configuration to maintain and promote the flour at their flourishing, and they have causal power separate to its recognition. I would suggest that worth or intrinsic value can be understood to be referring to those specific properties, and actually we recognize that worth through those use of rationally directed emotions. Now, if that's the case, it's theoretically possible that we can use a concrete study to examine what mechanisms are affected at a structural level and what are those effects to identify the worth that is the factual basis for value statements and control values. I'm going to build on to that, and this is one of the arguments in the latest here, part of the book, that actually when you talk about that, you may be able to understand that morality itself has worth within society. Because and you're drawing a distinction there between worth as having causal powers at a structural level being separately separate to the cause of those moral values. And finally from that, if all structures have got mechanisms that cause their continuation or their flourishing, then you can't have an idea of morality that restricts it only to humanity. It allows you to understand environmental ethics and animal rights in a completely different way because we must value the flourishing of beings other than that ourselves and recognize what has intrinsic value to those other beings. So finally, then, to move on to how we can develop a greater understanding of morality, again, using that, that building on critical naturalism by using an ethical naturalist approach, working through that logic of scientific discovery, what we're trying to identify is mechanisms that we cannot see but can only observe by their effects that promote the flourishing of structures. And our starting point of that is probably our existing values. What do we currently value. And when we move on from there to try and do our model building, our emotional re response to circumstances is part of our area of study, as well as being part of our application of our cognitive processes. And of course, in the empirical testing stuff, what you're talking about here is that because all aspects of reality have worth, whilst there is a significant amount of work and necessarily must be done within the social sciences, there's other areas of work that can be done within the natural sciences to identify things that have intrinsic value. And I think that then may lead you theoretically to be able to turn around and say that this existing value is true or false. And I've put a massive amount of riders around that because if you've got a false theory of thermodynamics, it makes no difference to the world. 
If you have a false theory of morality, it makes it can make a massive difference to the lives of those around you, particularly if you're in a position of power. So you have to be really careful when you're making a judgment around a moral value and saying that it's, a, it's not true, or it is true, sorry. But I think there's a possibility of exploring those false moral values more because what you can understand is actually there is no, if you can identify there's no relationship between an existing value and underlying intrinsic worth within the world, then it's easier to say that that's a false value. But also, and this is um, again the conclusion of the book, is if we can develop, or can we understand theoretically how we can develop an explanation of morality, that means that some moral judgments should be able to be made just purely on the basis of the description of the regulative harm. Over here, when we look at those results from regularities, for example, if we can say that people who are uh, enslaved by other people have significant regularity of harm, i.e. lower life expectancy, et cetera, et cetera, then you can move directly to that from that to a negative moral judgment without having to go through the explanation of actually what is the flourishing. To eradicate slavery, clearly you need to understand those slave communities and you need to be able to understand what the mechanisms are relevant. But actually to make a moral judgment, moral judgments can be supported on a descriptive account of harm. So I have whizzed through this a little bit, I must admit, um, and hopefully the book allows it lays out in a lot more um, easy to read, easy to understand format. I've tried my best to absolutely make it apply to the general reader um, as much as I possibly can. And within that book, I explore the application of critical realism to those wider moral questions. And I draw that conclusion that it's possible to use meta theory to sort of critical realism to support practical research in piety by using the three typical framework that I lay out, which I believe is a synthesis and development of the existing approaches. Thanks very much. I'll stop sharing, Dave. Great, thank you. Thank you, Steve. We're now going to have an almost seamless transition from uh, me chairing to James chairing, who was, I believe James had some trouble <laughs> logging in, which I've been trying to manage. So that's what James, well, uh, apologies. <laughs> Half an hour of fighting with IT, just like the good old days of uh, teaching online. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm not sure where we were with the introductions, having arrived rather late. Um, did, did, you, did you introduce yourself, Dave, or shall I, shall I introduce you now and, and hand over to you for your comments? So... Yeah, feel free to introduce me. Thank you very much, Dave. So those of you who don't know Dave, uh, you're a... Uh, uh, a senior fellow at Loughborough University. Sorry, I've, I had my lovely presentation for you both on this this screen, which I've now had to close down. So uh, do do uh, do correct me if I my memory of my presentation is is poor. Um, senior senior research fellow at Loughborough University uh, in working in the social sciences. And uh, uh, without further ado, if I could pass over to you for your for your comments, sir, uh, Dave. Thank you, James. Um, I'm I'm going to try and stick to my. I was at ten minutes, so um, I'm only going to say three things I think about Steve's book. The first two quite briefly, and the, the third one at a bit more length. Um, first thing I want to say is that this is a, this is a really good book, and you should read it. Um, it's um, it's probably the most comprehensive account of the, the main critical realist views on on the nature of value, values, morality, and worth that that, that there is. And maybe there's one I haven't read that I, maybe Lee will tell me there's one miss that I've missed, but I, I think that it's this is probably the one. Um, Steve gives really good, clear explanations and, and measured evaluations of of the works of, of, of the key thinkers in the tradition. Um, Including Bhaskar, who's often quite difficult to make sense of, but, but he succeeds. Um, and the topic is a vital one for the critical realist project, certainly as Bhaskar understood it, and, and I think most of us, because I think most of us want to, to develop critical work. And, and, and Bhaskar, as Bhaskar saw, a kind of critical realist ethics is uh, an important part of underlaboring for a critical and emancipatory 
social science. So, so understanding you know, what we ought to be able to say about ethics is, is crucial. Um, I think Steve is right to argue that no one tradition has really given a comprehensive solution that delivers a, a basis of critique. Um, and you know, I, I, I think his attempt to, to provide a basis on, on a kind of intrinsic value argument is um, is probably about the best version of that that we've got so far. But I'm going to say this is my second thing, uh, and, and Steve will be expecting this. Um, but I think that the kind of moral realism that's implicit in that isn't really uh, sustainable. I think um, I think you know Steve and Baskar and Andrew Collier and, and quite a few others in the critical realist tradition are still attached to this idea that there's some kind of intrinsic value, something that's objectively um, right and good, um, that's kind of independent of what we all think about it. And, and as I've argued before in the paper that, that Steve mentioned and, and discusses in the book, um, I, I don't think that uh, that's a viable argument. Um, you know, I, I, to be clear, I don't doubt that morals and values are real, but they're real, I think, in the sense that they exist as the beliefs of individuals backed up by normative social structures, as you know, as Steve illustrated in that um, interpretation of, of Vasco's TMSA. Um, but there's an important distinction between that and the idea of moral realism as the, the existence of intrinsic value, the idea that they're uh, because the point about morality as a kind of human and social product is that you know, understanding the ontology of it doesn't lead to the conclusion that those values are actually objectively right. It just leads to the conclusion that they exist and that they influence who we are and how we act. Um, and, and it seems to me that Steve, uh, along with Bascon and Collier and others, is trying to get us to an understanding of um, ethics and morality that can ground um, critical stance on a totally solid base, a base of objectively right values. And there are no such values. Um, I don't think, by the way, that that leads to kind of extreme relativism about value. And, and, and if, you, if you were to look at my paper, you would see that I have a an alternative approach to that. Um, but I don't want to say any more about that now because I want to focus more directly and, and a bit more narrowly on, on my third point, which is to, to discuss the, the theory of intrinsic value that Steve develops in the book and particularly in the last chapter, which is, which is very interesting. But, but in the end, I think there are some problems with it. And um, I'd be interested to see what Steve thinks of my argument. I, I kind of suspect that he, under, he, he, he he knows this already, what I'm going to say, <laughs> but he's been slightly avoiding the issue. So but I don't know, perhaps I'm being too harsh or too generous, but, but we'll see. Um, so Steve in the end offers us what, what I want to call a, a structural flourishing theory of value or worth. In other words, he says that, um, you know, things have worth, things have value when their causal powers contribute positively to the flourishing of other structures. Um, and to make that my discussion simple, I'm going to call these things A things and B things, you know, where the implication is that we should value A things because they contribute positively to the flourishing of other B things. Now, I think there's an obvious form with the form of the obvious problem with the form of the argument as I've given it so far, which is that the B thing, that the A thing is helping to flourish, might not be something we want to flourish. So let's say, for example, that the B thing is um, the COVID virus. Um, well, Steve's argument seems to suggest that a structure that contributes to the flourishing of the COVID virus has worth because it contributes to the flourishing of this other structure. Or perhaps we might think of you know, the B structure as being you know, the Nazi party in the 1930s. 
So if we have an A thing that contributes to the flourishing of the Nazi party in the 1930s, then Steve's argument seems to suggest that we should think that A has worked because it contributes to the flourishing of the Nazi party in the 1930s. And, and, and I'm pretty sure that Steve would be uncomfortable with that. Um, and there's, at first sight, there's a kind of obvious response to that. And the obvious response to that would be to kind of change the structural flourishing theory of worth to, into a kind of recursive structural flourishing theory of worth. So we say, well, um, the worth of A doesn't just depend on how it contributes to the flourishing of B, but also depends on how B contributes to the flourishing of C and so on through D and E and C, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that kind of fixes the, the Nazi party problem because you know A contributes to the flourishing of B, which is the Nazi party, but then B goes on to contribute, you know, a, a, you know incredibly negatively to the flourishing, incredibly harmful towards the flourishing of millions of other people. So A is no longer of worth because the thing it's preserving is itself of, of you know, a, a very strong negative worth. Um, that's, that's good, um, but it doesn't really save the theory, I don't think, because not all of the cases are going to work out quite so neatly. And, and the COVID version, I think, probably is one that uh, doesn't work out so neatly because uh, let's try and follow through. Maybe we can make it more uh, more clear cut by uh, by talking about COVID plus. Let's imagine a virus that's like COVID, but but actually, if it's allowed to flourish, will you know kill the entire human population of the world? Okay, so the um, the first version of the theory said, well, you know, we should we should do what we can. You know, we should we should we should value structures that support the flourishing of COVID plus because you know supporting other things other structures flourishing gives something worth. Um, what does the second version, the recursive version of the theory say? Well the recursive version says well now we have to consider the further chain of consequences that follows. So let's say we we, we allow COVID plus to flourish and it wipes out the entire human race. Um, that that might sound bad to us, but hold on. What are the further consequences? Well, it turns out the human race is probably the single structure in the world today that does most harm to the flourishing of other structures. Um, I, I haven't checked the numbers, but I believe that something like 30 or 40 percent of the species of the world have become extinct in the last 50 to 100 years largely as a result of, of human activity, pollution, destruction of ecosystems, global warming, and probably that will continue to be the case. Um, so maybe on the basis of this argument that we should look at structures in terms of what effect they have on the flourishing of other structures, maybe the human race ought to be eliminated and and this thing that supports the flourishing of COVID plus which then wipes out the human race might end up in the moral calculus um, that seems to be implicit in Steve's argument um, to be a good thing that we should actually support and encourage. Um, so it seems to me that the kind of the original version of the theory you know which left us valuing things that, that support the flourishing of the Nazi party doesn't work and the recursive version that um, leads us to the conclusion that we should support the, the, the elimination of the human race um, doesn't really work either. Um, and I think that that's, kind of, that's not surprising in a way because I think the trouble with, with human morality, which, which is very rarely recognized is that it's intensely speciesist and that any kind of attempt to turn our moral intuitions into um, an argument about them being objectively right or morally real is in the end going to fail on that rock because 
that speciesism is something that we can justify um, in objective terms. It's a it's a part of what we are, but it's not necessarily something that can be ultimately ethically justified. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, it's it's a very specific challenge that I've set out to Steve. Um, obviously, there are other issues which I, I've mentioned more briefly, but I would be interested to know um, whether Steve Pat, has he thought through these questions already? Perhaps does he have an alternative solution, and and and, and how might he respond to them? Thank you, Dave. Um, so if we would return to that, I guess, in, in uh, Steve's response uh, slot in the agenda. I also noticed we have a question from Chris uh, Yates in the chat and, and a long comment stroke question from Deborah Parks. Um, I would also propose to return to those at the beginning of the, 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 the Q&A session at two o'clock and to now move over to Lee Price uh, for your comments, Lee. So Lee is general editor of the Journal of Critical Realism. I've finally got my screens working properly now. <laughs> Apologies, Dave, but Lee gets the benefit. <laughs> uh, and senior research associate at Rhodes University uh, and a recent winner of the Cheryl Frank Memorial Prize uh, for the best new writing in the tradition of critical realism. Uh, and also I've had the great pleasure of meeting you, uh, Lee, at, uh, at a, 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 a seminar at uh, Southampton a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, it feels like a lifetime ago. Mm. Bye there, Thanks Lee. so much, James. Yes, and lovely to see you again. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you, everyone, and especially thank you um, to Steve for um, putting together this um, very, very useful book. Um, and I had the pleasure of um, examining it, actually. And um, it certainly, as Dave said, it's a fantastic, um, shall we say, um, it, it beautifully brings together several of the different approaches to morality and ethics that we do find under the umbrella of critical realism. And so thank you, Steve, for that uh, very useful piece of work. And, um, and just to say that, um, so Steve works through these different ideas and he obviously comes up with his suggestion, which, um, you know, he've just given us. And uh, he works quite closely with um, the mor moral theories of several critical realists, such as Andrew Collier, uh, Dave Eldervas, um, Andrew Sayer, and myself. And um, one of the things I'd like to congratulate um, Steve on is his um, sensitivity in um, discussing these different authors, because he, he very carefully tries to reproduce the ideas kind of faithfully. And that's really important because so often, you know, when people um, describe somebody else's work, they are a little bit sort of um, lackadaisical or gung-ho with it. And, um, and they don't really get a clear idea of what the person was saying. But I think Steve is very sensitive and he does present these people's ideas very carefully. And so thank you again for that too. Um, okay. Um, so, but just, but like um, Steve, um, I mean, like Dave, I've also com don't completely agree with, um, with Steve's um, present presentation. And so I'm going to um, give my, give a little presentation. And I'm also, I also have a question for, um, for Steve. So I'm going to share my screen, hopefully be able to um, find it. Okay. So it's, um, I'm trying to share my screen, but for some reason I can't see my slides. So just bear with me. Hmm. Okay. Ah, there you go, show all windows. My problem is I think I have too many windows open. There you go. Right, can you see that? Great. Okay. Um, so, um, so first of all, just to say that what we all seem to agree on. Um, and so Sayer, Sayer's argument is that um, we want our moral values are express a shared commitment to a human commitment a shared commitment to a human commitment that is rooted in 
emergent and rooted in, rooted in and emergent from biological normativity. So he feels that um, we get our ideas. He's also against moral realism, by the way. But he thinks that, um, so in that way, he's similar to Dave. Um, and so he thinks that we, we can work out what's good from what's kind of biologically good. Um, Dave Eldervas also says that, um, you know, we need to support all humans to stay alive if they rationally wish to do so, and that we should achieve the basic needs of all humans. And of course, Roy wanted us to achieve human flourishing. So, you know, we're committed to something that's good. Um, and, um, but not all of us are completely convinced um, that this commitment gets us past the problem that Hume discussed, which is, can we honestly say that we are able to use facts to give us values? And of course, Dave doesn't think so. Um, and, um, and in fact, Doug Popora is another critical realist who's talked a lot about ethics. And um, he, he says he's, he, it really bothers him, the secular commitment with ungrounded ethics. Okay, so somehow this commitment to what's good, he, uh, Doug doesn't think it's grounded. And I, and I think Dave doesn't think it's grounded. And my question for you, Steve, is how have you actually managed to ground it? And this is the quote, this is, what, this is a quote from your book, Steve, where I feel that you demonstrate that you haven't grounded it. So um, you say, in considering this, it should be recognized that all these theories identify human flourishing as having value. This is clear, not just in theories themselves, um, as in Mill, Trotsky and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Locke all join Aristotle in this commitment to human flourishing, but also because when considering all three groups of theories, the example of slavery shows how supposedly moral formulations can lead to ends that can be understood as immoral. What felt wrong in these situations was the use of a moral position to produce an outcome that goes against our common sense understanding of individual human flourishing. So Steve, what I'm asking is, you know, this idea of what felt wrong and, and what is this common sense understanding of individual human flourishing? And so I think that that suggests a kind of an ungroundedness because can we just trust our feelings on what's wrong? And can we just trust our common sense understanding of individual human flourishing? Because as we've seen, and I think that this was the point that maybe that Dave was making, is that we can really get it wrong when we do that. So is there something more than that, Steve, that we can ground things in? Um, and um, Roy Bascar himself, and I'm not gonna read this quote, um, but he basically said that it's this ungroundedness, this kind of assumption that we can know what's right from the facts, um, from, that is, it's, and he said that it is precisely on this rock that most previous attempts at the refutation of the, that you cannot go from facts to values idea, have founded, floundered. So Roy Bascar felt we had, to, we couldn't sort of just go from what we know is good for humans to, and jump to a moral position. Something else had to ground it. Now, Doug Popora um, grounds it, I would guess probably in the cat, Catholic spirituality. Um, I think Dave tries to ground it in a kind of democracy. So what people would ultimately think of as right. Um, and I think Roy Bascar gr grounds it in a very different way. So um, he grounds it by, by looking at what are the, the truths or the, what are the stories that we tell us behind our moral position. So for example, what are the stories that slave owners tell themselves to justify their slavery? And can we show that those stories are incorrect? So he takes a step back. He doesn't say, is slavery wrong? He says, are the facts upon which we base our idea of slavery wrong? Okay, so, and he argues that whatever it is stopping us from having a true understanding of the situation that should be the focus of our moral action. Because basically, as soon as we know the truth of it, it pretty, 
our, our moral actions pretty much follow. So for example, you know, we know or well, what's good for us follows. We know that because of gravity, we don't step off roof. We will kill ourselves, okay? So once we know the truth of it, the moral action kind of follows. So Roy Bascar shifts this and he grounds his morality in this truth of the situation. But he, and so he feels that that resolves this, this problem, which he says basically is faced by mo most moral um, theories. Okay. And so, and we can see this by Kant, he says, so Kant really had the same idea of he felt, he, he felt that the moral law was within him, okay? And so that's how he was able to justify his morality. And whereas Roy Bascar said, it's not that there are star, the starry heavens above and the moral law within, as Kant would have it, Rather, the true basis of your virtuous existence is in the fact that the starry heavens are within you and you are within them. Okay, so that was Bascar's take um, on it. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say. And so just to ask the question again, Steve, how do you feel that you have pr provided a ground um, or a basis to move from facts to values? Okay, and that's, I'm finished. Thank you, James. Thank you very much, Lee. So uh, over to Steve now to uh, to respond to the comments, questions from, from Dave and Lee, in the order that you wish, Steve. <laughs> okay, Thank, thanks. Thanks very much for that. There is a, there is a lot there. Um, <laughs> so I will try and break it down as much as I possibly can uh, to explain some of those positions, I think. So I think what, starting with the last one of, of Lee's, which is really that meta-reality position, um, as, as set up by Roy Bascar, where everything has value because everything is one. And those, like I said, the starry heavens are within us. Now, I don't draw a conclusion in any way whatsoever on whether or not that position is right or wrong, because what I argue is it's a very abstract position in relation to practical morality. It doesn't help the situations that Dave described with the A and the B options of flourishing would be ones where actually, if everything has value, it's the same with Collier's being and worth, if everything has value, how would you manage to make a moral choice between two different courses of action? Now, what Roy doesn't lay out very much in, 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 in Metro Reality is how you would make that moral choice. He just talks about that being connected with the ground state, which if you haven't managed to have a transcendental experience, means that you can't really make that decision at a, a point of moral concern. Um, what, what Andrew Collier tried to overcome it with was this hierarchy of work, which ultimately didn't work because you can't understand it on the gentle notion of causality. So I'm not really comfortable with that approach. I'd rather try and work out some sort of concrete um, morality that is, that is useful and understandable. Moving on to the common sense position, I think that whilst I express in the view that yes, all those moral theories that have a common sense position, which feels wrong, and they can go on to talk about how actually, as, as Collier points out, that our common sense understanding of the world really comes from Aristotle across a wide range of things. And just because it comes from Aristotle, we call it common sense, doesn't mean it's right. And uh, there's a book I refer to quite a lot in my book um, by Bernard Williams called Ethics and Limits of Philosophy which talks about the, the move, really, really good book, and I'd recommend it to anybody, although of course I'm recommending mine as well. Um, it's a really good book, and what it talks about in there is that the original Socrates, question of Socrates around ethics was very much, how should I live? What Aristotle did was he, he changed that question to being, what is good for man? Now, if the moral question is, what is good for man, then you cannot have an answer without a reference to some kind of human flourishing. So that common sense approach and that understanding of morality comes very much from Aristotle, but that doesn't mean it's correct. What I try to argue for with the position of intrinsic value is really, and this is, I think, where criticalism helps again. Let me just share my screen again a second. Um, What creative critical religion does is allows us a depth realist understanding of the world where we continue exploring and making, making more understanding of the world. So what I would suggest is that 
Dave's business and me and Dave have argued for this for about 14 years, I think at least. And I didn't think I was going to, I was going to be able to convince him of the, of the rights of moral realism. So I just had to accept that that's, a, that's an ongoing task to try and argue for. But what you've got over here is that, that social perspective of values and moral agency and just the interaction of socialization, reproduction, transformation. If you argue that there's an intransitive object of values that our existing values are based on, then that's a depth realist position. What I'm trying to argue is actually you, you, to understand that you need to go deeper and try to understand an intransitive object of work. Now, that's, I know that's a very speculative position, but what that is is saying that our existing moralities should be in some respect based upon some sort of understandable recognition of what has value. But of course, we're rational agents. And that's the key thing about morality is it's not going to be absolutely aligned with the value. There will be some sort of relational concept within that. And actually, yes, there will be some speciesism within that as well. But our existing values should in some way, if they're objective values, in an objective morality, align in some way with the, the value that is outside of it. Our, our, our own lives and the values that's intrinsic in life. Now, I suggest a way of how you can potentially explore that. And that's what I'm laying out really as a theoretical framework says, actually, this is how I think you could actually go and move forward to try and identify something that has objective value. But I'm not putting forward a moral code as an objective set of values within there. I'm just saying that it's potential that we could explore and we could find out that that out. That would allow for questions such as um, Dave's where you've got the structure A and the structure B to explore in some way by hopefully some sort of reference to objective values, but also, yes, understand that relational sort of concept of there. And understand that just because something creates a structure to flourish, like say the world is very in interdependent and structures are part of bigger structures. And some of those bigger structures the smaller structures may be working within a way that is counteractive towards the bigger structure. So um, you can say that the, the structure of the COVID virus, which is David's example, is working against the structure of human society. But you could also, and again, this is very speculative, you could all argue that the structure of human society is ask, uh, uh, um, working against the structure of natural reality of which that human society is dependent upon. And so you might have to argue there needs to be some sort of change on moral grounds within human society to be able to support the flushing of the bigger structure, which that human society is dependent upon, if that makes sense. And I've kind of, I think I've just kind of almost in that breezed across um, several of those questions without doing any of them injustice. Um, I'm just if that's okay, pull into some of the other questions in the chat bar. Um, before continuing that conversation on those particular questions. So if I look across at some of those in there, so can morality be both real and pure? I think the argument I put forward is morality is real um, in the fact that it has causal power. In anything that has causal power must be real um, by definition, so morality is real. Can it be plural? Well, we know there's existing moralities. And so, yeah, I, I don't think that's that's that's... I think that's a question that I think my theoretical framework doesn't answer, but allows for that to be explored in a way that may be able to produce an answer. Um, Dave's argument is no such thing as intrinsic right values. Um, yeah, I think this is this is really where myself and Dave differ. And I think again, I pull out in the book the difference between um, what's known as regional and universal ethics. So the regional concerns of ethics being those of this particular, um, I use uh, Dave's word here, norm circle. So for example, within medicine, there is a set of ethical standards because the, the benefit of medicine is seen as the continuation of human life. And so therefore you can have ethical standards that allows you to make a judgment that why a doctor can take out a healthy kidney out of a healthy person, but whereas if a business person tried to do that, that would be grievous bodily harm. Um, and so medical ethics covers those kind of areas, and there is a reference point of being the, the outcome. The question of whether we can actually, and this comes on to the teleology of morality, whether you can do that in relation to um, the wider society, I say I don't offer an answer to that, but what I do I hope is present a theoretical framework 
which allows those questions to be explored in a way that allows us to tease out the difference between facts and values. Um, and I think the, it's interesting the reference to counseling, psychology, social work. And again, this comes back to, um, I think Collier's description of um, rational, rationally directed emotions with his understanding of moral psychology of being the head and the heart, not being in opposition, but actually have rational or international direction uh, emotions. And, you know, I think Deborah will probably be able to speak on this much better than I can, from my understanding of things like cognitive behavioral therapy are actually your emotions are not right or wrong, but actually in those circumstances, they're inappropriate because they're irrational to the circumstances that you're in. And I think you can then refer that back to the understanding of moral psychology, being those rational directed emotions, actually, is it, what I'm arguing for, is it right? Is it a time to some sort of intrinsic value? And can I understand what that intrinsic value is? Um, so discussion of morality within critical realism, how would we reject positions outside of critical realism? Um, and I think on those, I would just explore them. And I do explore several art, several in the book. So I explore Mill, Kant, um, Aristotle. Uh, the, the, actually, if you understand them being models of mechanisms, if you understand them on a gentric notion of causality, that allows you to draw them in there. That rationalised idea about morality being derived from necessary conditions of agency. Again, I, I think that is covered very much within uh, my discussion of Sayer, because I think Sayer covers that really well when, his, when he talks about actually why is a morality a necessary condition of agency. So I think that's kind of like a partial explanation of morality, not an alternative explanation of morality. It's one that I think Sayer encompasses, and then that allows me to hopefully encompass Sayer's approach within the approach of Collier, Elder Vass, and Bascal and myself to try and understand those wider moral questions. Um, I don't know if I've answered those questions or not. I'll leave it to those who asked them, to be honest, if that's okay. Thank you, Steve. Well, maybe that's the, the first point for us to start with the, the opening to the floor is for, for the, the questions. I noticed Chris has, has, has had to leave us, but uh, Deborah and Alex are still here. Uh, was there anything you, the two of you, wanted to follow up on, uh, on Steve's comments, responses? Hello, well, uh, I guess I guess I guess what I'm having difficulty myself. Yeah, this is Deborah here. Um, I I guess what I'm having difficulty is it seems to me that we're sort of looking at morals as something um, out there and that are fixed. And and I guess you know morals have a lot to do with how we're thinking and what our intentions are. So, for example you know, I had this thought. So if, if we had a belief system that if we believed that it would be actually healthy for every child to have a teaspoon of arsenic for breakfast every morning, then, you know, one could argue that withholding arsenic from certain groups of children would be, you know, an unethical, I don't, I don't, I'm not so keen on the term moral, but, um, you know, an unethical uh, position, even though in the end um, that they may, those children may be better off because they're not getting something that harms them. Um, so I guess I, I'm having, yeah, that's where I'm kind of thinking in how we're thinking about um, morals and values and also the idea of facts. You know, if, I mean, if we're going to use facts, I mean, facts are used in the interest of trying to uh, point to a given um, outcome or desired outcome. Um, but we're going to pull on those facts that are going to uh, bring about the outcome that we believe is desirable. So it seems to me that we sort of get caught up in a little bit of a um, self-fulfilling um, approach there. Anyway, those are some of the thoughts that I'm left with and, and the best I can do to try and put them into words for now. Thank you very much. Steve, anything you wanted to, to add before uh, we open for more questions? Yeah, I, I think, you know, this, the understanding of facts is really interesting. I think, um, again, something that I refer to in the book is, is, is Bascar's conception of a truth. 
which the the truth of something is its underlying structure or, or I've, I've, someone else can define that a lot better than I can. I can't get up on the top of my head, but that underlying structures, the truth of um, that water boils in 100, 100 degrees centigrade lays in its molecular structure. So when you talk about, okay, is it good or bad to give children arsenic? Actually, there's a truth to that statement. It's a factual statement. And that's an underlying, under, that's, and this truth is about the underlying structure of human biology and arsenic. So you can make a truth judgment on that. And on that truth judgment, you can say whether it's right or wrong to give children arsenic. Well, it, except that I would say that that's one level, you know, is on the biological level, but the other level is how we treat other human beings. And do, you know, do I value other children as much as I value my own children? No, so those are, those to me are two very different levels. You know, one is a sort of a, a live or die biology issue. The other is, you know, do I value others as equal in worth? Right. So I don't, I don't know that they go on the same, you know, kind of go in the same paragraph. And then when we talk about everything has intrinsic value, I mean, I sit here and I think, well, I don't know. Do, I, I don't know. Does Putin have equal value? Like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure that out, you know? Yeah. So I, I don't argue everything has intrinsic value. I think, you know, what Collier argues is that everything has intrinsic value, which, which has a, um, has a difficulty with it. And I think, you know, Basco's position that we're all one, we all have, you know, so we all have value. There's difficulties. What I'm trying to understand is actually there's some aspects of the world that have intrinsic value. And we can understand those aspects of the world having intrinsic value. But they may not have intrinsic value in different structures, or there may be things that are absent in the structure that would give value if they were in that structure, because you can understand the notion of flourishing the structure. So an example, again, I'll go back to a very mechanistic example, is you think an arch, every single key, every single brick in an arch is the same brick, but the keystone, which is the same as every other brick apart from its position in that structure, has more value to every, than any other brick in that structure because of its position in the arch. And I think on that basis, you can understand intrinsic value of being something that applies to an understanding of mechanisms promoting the flourishing of the structures they're part of or other structures which doesn't mean that every single thing in the world has value if that makes sense it has value if it has causal power for the promotion of flourishing of a particular structure and has value to that structure and nowhere else you know if a brick falls on your head that has no value whilst it was in the arts it had value Thank you, Steve. I, I can see we have a, a, an interesting couple of questions from, from Fridelis in the uh, in the chat, but L Lee's hand went up, I think, in response to something specific you just said. So if I could go to Lee and then go to Fridelis, your question. Um, just to say that um, Roy Bascar also talks about negatively valuing things. So some things we can, you know, we positively value things, but we can also have negative values for things that we think are wrong. Um, and, you know, I, for me, the, the key with his work was that he started out talking about the objective, moral, moral objectives, <clears throat> and then he put a, a slash between the object, so he wrote objective, object slash if, so the, ob, the moral objective. And so what he was trying to do there was to say that we, we need to um, kind of question that moral objective because that's kind of the thing that we all just take for granted. You know, from Kant, who was amazed by the moral law within him. He, and you know, for, for many of us who come from a feminist, have a bit of a feminist background or, um, or an anti-colonial background, for example, uh, we're really suspicious of this idea of a moral law within that we can somehow know what's right by just thinking about it because we've seen this moral law being used against women, men, um, you know, black people, uh, LGBTQ, people everywhere. Th this idea of a, a deep moral knowing seems very suspicious to a lot of us who have been the brunt of that moral knowing, who have seen the consequences of it. Um, and so that's why I think it's so important with Roy that he actually challenges that initial moral knowing, that objective, are we even right about our objectives? And where do we get our objectives from? And I think that's that's really key. Anyway, I don't know if that helps. Uh, I was particularly thinking about Deborah's questions. 
very much, Lee. Let me, uh, in that case, uh, if there was, an, is there anything you wanted to say to in response, Steve? Yeah, I think that's, you know, um, I don't disagree with anything Lee's saying at all about that, that moral sense. And I think there's something when I, when I, in the chapter where I discussed how you would inquire into morality, there's something that was is within um, the Explained Society book, which is a fantastic book, which I pull on, which is that idea of overcoded abduction. And actually something, just because it feels right, you can then go and try and just justify your original thought process and say, well, that's what I value, therefore this must be right, and how do I justify that? And actually being really careful of that, um, that overcoded abduction, ensuring that you're not just assuming that because it feels good to you, it should be valued because of all that historical stuff and, you know, we're all products of our upbringing and things like that, and you have to make sure you take that step back. So, so all I'm trying to do is suggest a way that we can perhaps do that exploration in a way that takes us away from our own values and our own thought process. So we're not justifying ourselves. We're trying to explore actually something that's separate to us. And we're trying to discover something true around the world. Um, if that helps. Thank you, Steve. Um, so we have a, a series of questions there from, mm. from Fidelis. Uh, Fidelis, do you want to come on screen? Or, 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 or let Steve work through your, your uh, comments and questions? Hello. Uh, thank Hello. you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve, for uh, the excellent presentation. I think I've put the question on the chat box just to in case uh, um, my uh, language is uh, hard or difficult to understand. But I think um, with the with with, with I have the feeling that you are approaching your uh, morality on the basis of uh, meta um, theory, but my understanding of the presentation is, um, I think in meta theory, when you get to a level where you have to make a choice between A and B, and which is, I guess, which is what um, the prize also is trying to um, tease out, the objective in you that you believe concrete, because you, you, you made mention of that the moral discussion is not concrete enough for you. So how, individual come to conclusion as which to follow and which not to follow on the beliefs uh, which uh, Dave Eldevar also talk about the beliefs in one uh, of what you may perceive as objective is not the same way structure like, like you mentioned small and bigger structure which in real sense we normally know that the small structure suffer the consequence of whatever decision one may arrive at so on that basis, how will you make that decision? And that's what I, I, I touch on uh, Kant's impersonal duty. Okay. Um, I, I think, and actually that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think for me, the answer to the first part about how do you perceive to be moral between two structures, there's no easy answer to that. I mean, ultimately you're gonna to have to do a, you know, an ethical naturalist inquiry. And again, in the book, I said how I, I suggest that drawing on Lee's work and, and other people's work, how an ethical and naturalist inquiry should progress. Now, that's not to say it's easy in any way whatsoever, because you're dealing with social reality. And again, Collier makes that distinction about social reality and social science just being an epistle with. You, you, because the limits on social science, the ontological, the relational the limits, et cetera, you actually wouldn't be able to come to a very, very firm conclusion. All I'm suggesting is there's a way that you would possibly explore that using ethical naturalism, but you'd have to be very, very careful about how you apply those findings. You'd have to, uh, and again, this is set out in the chapter, once you come to a conclusion, what is better A or B? Well, don't just go and crack on with it because that's gonna cause no end of problems. You, you know, applications of morality in the real world with um, what people perceive to be moral positions have caused some, horrendous amount of human suffering. So you need to actually be pretty certain on your ground and work that through and then look at further historical examples to try and determine whether or not A and which one out of A and B may be the most correct one. And then very attentively move forward on that with always the position of revising your own views on it and saying, actually, I think I was wrong because as I'm starting to see this cash out, 
it doesn't look like what I thought was going to be the case with the case. We're dealing with social reality and it's incredibly complex. Um, all I'm saying in certain circumstances, you may be able to make a judgment of one decision over another on the basis of some rational grounds. But it's a very tentative conclusion. In relation to the Kantian question, that's a really interesting question. And I, one of the things I don't like about um, dialectical critical realist ethics is where um, Bascar's point on the university of desire, because he brings in this principle where he says, actually, if I, des you know, if I desire something, then I'm logically required mm. to expand that to fulfilling everybody else's desires. Now, that's a Kantian position. And I don't think you need the Kantian position. I much rather prefer what Andrew Sayer says, where he drills into morality as actually being a product of our upbringing and talks about those psychosomatic marks or those somatic markers that are, are brought on for us through a duty of care, which is why we care about us collectively and not individuals. And it's, word, it's the word us that he uses there that makes his position a moral position when he talks about the development of the human brain. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold with the Kantian position. I don't see morality as an impersonal duty. I see morality as actually, it is an inevitable part of human society. I totally agree with what Pascal says that it will always emerge in humans in society in nature. And what we have to do is move from our current transitive theories of morality to being one that is more objective, but we can never achieve a fully objective morality, but we can achieve a more objective morality in our current morality by using the techniques of critical natural uh, critical realism. Thank you very much. Is that useful for if I if I missed the question? Is there anything you wanted to, to comment back on, uh, Fidelis? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think um, just so, yeah. Um, I don't know with uh, Basca, a dialectical view of morality, I think um, we are in a group study, for example. So we looked at uh, it and then try to make decisions uh, on that, on the basis with Hegel and Kant. But then uh, when we zoom into universality, then we see that maybe Kant and Basca have similarity in their views in, in the way they approach morality. But then uh, we realize that Basca believes that, um, or, or yeah, has the suggestion that Kant view did not go that deep to, be, to understand universality, which is where I think they differ. But I, I, but I just wanted to have your opinion, but you've mentioned that, so I'm, I'm fine with it. Thank you Thank very you. much. I'm keeping one eye on time here, which is ironic considering how late I was. Um, <laughs> uh, perhaps we could go to Lee, because I see you have your hand, then Julian's question in the chat as the last question in the chat, and I'm keen to bring, oh, Dave's got his hand up, I was going to say, I was keen to bring you back in, Dave, as well. <laughs> so maybe we go Lee, Dave, and then Julian, and then final comments from Steve. So, Lee, please. Okay, um, just to explain um, a couple of things. First of all, Roy's idea of universality. So what he really wanted to avoid, he was like, so how do we avoid moral autocracy, like moral absolutism? Um, and he really just uses the same principle that he uses for, for understanding um, truth and knowledge generally. And that is, let's say you have a universal principle that, you know, we all pretty much agree on like um, that it's it's not a good idea for us for human beings to go around hurting each other and we can justify that because you know well none of in both the strong and weaker justifications that Steve would mention in his book um, but then at the same time so that's at the level of um, the real um, and it's kind of an alethic idea but then at the at the empirical level where it works out on the ground um it, it's very relativist because there are certain situations in the open system where you know you might have to defend yourself and your act of self-defense may harm somebody else is that justifiable well according to even our greatest non-violent person gandhi you know you are allowed to defend yourself so 
So Roy avoids that absolutist morality, but still manages to maintain some version of, 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 um, of universality by having this idea of his layered reality where you have the real, the actual, and the empirical. So at the empirical level, contextual issues can always create a different morality, a different ethics. And, we, and yet we can still talk about general universal principles at the level of the real. Um, yeah, so that's really what I wanted to say. And I won't say any more because I'll take up too much more, too much time. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Dave, over to you. Uh, thanks, James. I was I was just going to respond to Alex's question in the uh, chat, which uh, which we haven't really said much about, and um, uh, which I think is interesting. I, I don't know much. Uh, he asks of whether or what we think about um, some positions outside critical realism. One of them um, from Gravur, which I, I I I'm not qualified to say anything about. But the other one is. Um, what Alex you call the empiricist sort of positive position that morals are a result of evolutionary processes. Um, and, and I think I'm not sure that, that is necessarily an empiricist a positivist view. It seems to me that that we one of the things about critical uh, realism is that we have you can have simultaneously both an understanding of the, the history, the historical development of something, and it's sort of current um ontological structure as a you know structure with causal powers and and we actually need both of those um and and so i think we can say that the moral structures which i think of as you know, social structures you know exist in the present as emergent structures that depend on the interactions of people but they also depend on on the history that has made us the kind of people that we are and part of that history is evolutionary and part of that, that evolutionary history is that you know, we have evolved to be kind of interdependent social beings. And that only works if you have a sense of what we're calling morality now, a sense of obligations to each other and responsibilities to each other. And you know, you might still be competing and fighting as well at another level, but but I think we have a sense of morality in the first place because of the way that we've evolved and and therefore we can build that into a, a an understanding of morality as a social fact which, which has developed over time um, i'll stop there because i know we're running out of time thank you very much dave steve um uh, are you happy to uh, respond to, to Julian's question? Yes, uh, as, yeah. as part of your concluding comments and any, any final comments that, that you might want to make? Uh, so part of the concluding comments really, uh, uh, welcome to Julian, Th thanks for joining us. Lovely to see you on the call. Um, I think for our, my answer to that would be around the fact that I think Dave would totally agree with you. Um, I would slightly disagree, and I think there's a, a distinction I draw, I, I explore in the book, which is one that Sayer makes between things being socially produced and socially defined. And I think what that position of saying that all um, morality is transitive is that actually the process of definition is the process of production. And I think that's not an understanding of how morality actually is developed. And I'm, I, I, I go for the position that actually Dave was talking about earlier about that, almost that evolutionary one that actually and, and and Roy's position that actually there's something intrinsic about humans in nature in society that means morality always emerges and always will emerge and actually that means it's got an intransitive object which the theories are about um, I think in general just to summarize I've really enjoyed this hour and a half there's been some fantastic questions so thank you very much um, thank you to, to Dave and Lee um, for those challenges and those questions and also for as, as everything with critical realism uh, what I really enjoy about critical realism conferences critical realism events is the friendliness and the discussion and debate that we're all interested in just trying to explore some ideas and trying to find out what each other people perceive of you and I love those kind of discussions within critical realism and hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more face-to-face -face events again coming forward thanks again to James lovely to see you James and thanks for chairing um, and really, my, 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 my final closing comments would be just really please and I encourage you to, um, to get hold of a copy of the book and hopefully we can continue the discussion 
uh, on the basis of, 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 of the readings of it. So uh, that's probably it from me, James. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, well, from my point of view as a, as a humble sociolinguist, it's certainly given me plenty to think about. <laughs> uh, an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, look forward to reading, reading your book. Um, uh, any final final concluding comments from from Dave or Lee to, to wrap up? Uh, just to thank everyone for, for taking part and turning up. Mm, yeah, thanks everyone. Great. Thanks. That's an excellent note to end on. Thank you very much, everybody. It, it, it's really been really as I, I agree with with Steve as well it's the it's the interesting and friendly nature of the of the the discussion of some really complex issues that that uh, I, I think is absolutely wonderful thank you very much everybody